Hello and welcome to the first of what we hope becomes a useful resource for families uh, dealing with a pet that's been diagnosed with cancer. Uh, my name is Dr. Neil Malden. I am one of the oncologists here at the Western Veterinary Cancer Center, which is part of the Western Veterinary Specialist and Emergency Center located in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Um, we hope that the video series over time um, becomes a resource that allows us to talk about different treatment options and specific tumor types that we deal with in our veterinary cancer patients. But really for today, what I'd like to do is just start with some very basic cancer terms and give you an introduction to some of the things you may have to deal with if you have a pet that's been diagnosed with cancer and you're trying to work your way through the information and trying to make an informed decision uh, based on what the best treatment option is, not only for your pet, but for your family. So with that in mind, let's cover a few basic cancer terms. Uh, and then, as I said, we hope to expand on specifics a lot more in subsequent videos. Um, I hope you find the video informative and useful. Uh, please don't hesitate to pass this information on uh, if you do think uh, that it would be helpful to some other family dealing with this situation. So as I mentioned in the introduction, uh, today's video is really just a short introduction to some basic cancer terms. Uh, this is to try to get you maybe familiar with some of the concepts surrounding uh, dogs and cats with cancer uh, and to give you a little bit of information about some of the, of some of the treatment options that are available. Uh, we'll be covering a lot of these things in a lot more detail in subsequent videos. Uh, this is purely sort of your basic primer uh, as a starting point. So I think maybe the first question we should try to answer is what is cancer? And while this is an obviously extremely complex question with many, many parts to the answer, I think at its most basic what we can say is that cancer is unregulated cell growth. Uh, and what we mean by that is that the cancer cell has lost uh, the ability to respond to normal cellular control mechanisms. Uh, so this can have a lot of different very deleterious effects um, in your patient. So if the, if the tumor cell has decided that it's no longer going to respond to signals to stop growing when it comes into contact with neighbor cells, then we can just see unregulated growth locally and, and you know, invasion and destruction uh, of the primary site. Uh, if the cancer cell has figured out a way to ignore the signal telling it that it should not continue to grow and progress and then figures out a way to enter the bloodstream or the lymphatics and to spread to a distant part, uh, then that's an entirely different problem. Now we have a patient that's showing us a systemic level of aggression uh, because of their cancer cell. Uh, and that typically, that concept, I guess, really leads us to the, to the classification of a malignant versus a benign tumor. Um, we generally break cancer down into those two very large subcategories. And then under each one of those headings, there are many, many, many different kinds of cancer uh, that may be classified as either malignant or benign. Uh, but we really, when we think about tumors, that's kind of the first question we want to answer is, are we dealing with a malignant tumor or are we dealing with a benign tumor? So the word malignant implies uh, that a tumor has either an aggressive local behavior uh, and or a sy aggressive systemic behavior. Um, and that process of systemic spread is called metastasis. And uh, what that means is that the tumor gains access to either the bloodstream or the lymphatics and is able to spread, use that sort of as a subway or a conduit to spread throughout the body. Um, so when we think about malignant tumors, we think about a tumor that's either behaving in a locally aggressive manner, it's very invasive and destructive of the tissue around it, uh, or we think about a tumor that has a risk of spreading to other parts of the body. Uh, benign tumors, on the other hand, have a much less aggressive local behavior. So rather than being invasive and destructive into the, the normal surrounding tissues, uh, they tend to just grow and kind of push the normal tissue out of the way, what we call an expansile growth pattern. Um, and really, a benign tumor should have no risk of distant metastasis. Uh, if a tumor truly is benign, then it should not spread to another part of the body. Uh, part of the confusion comes in and that 
fairly infrequently, um, but it still does occur, we'll see a patient who has a biopsy report that suggests that the tumor is benign, but when we look at the patient, we see that we're dealing with a, with a tumor that's behaving in a systemically or locally aggressive manner. Uh, and it's just the nature of the beast. Unfortunately, cancer doesn't always go along with the script that you believe it should. Uh, and every once in a while, you're going to see a patient whose biopsy report and the clinical progression of their disease really don't go hand in hand and that the tumor's behaving in, a, in some manner different than what we had originally predicted. Another question we get asked quite frequently is how common is cancer in pet animals? And the answer to that question is actually fairly common. Uh, it's one of the most common causes of death and debilitating illness for both dogs and cats. Uh, if we try to look at the relative risk compared to humans, we think that dogs get cancer at approximately the same rate that humans do, uh, while the incidence of, of cancer in cats is actually a little bit lower. Um, if we try to look at actual rates for each species, uh, cancer is estimated to be the cause of death in 50% of dogs over the age of 10. Uh, so if you are a dog that makes it to double-digit years, um, you've got about a 50% shot of cancer being the, the eventual cause of your death. And then cancer is the cause of death in approximately one-third of cats, regardless of age. Uh, this age discrepancy uh, in cats is probably due to the fact that there are a couple of native retrovirus, uh, feline leukemia virus and feline immunodeficiency virus that can obviously be uh, contacted at an early age uh, and that um, uh, can both also relate to tumor development. And then other species do get cancer. Um, we've treated pelicans with radiation therapy and uh, corn snakes with chemotherapy, but we really don't have any reliable statistics uh, for them. Uh, we certainly know that some species uh, do get sp certain tumors, so hedgehogs uh, do get mammary cancer uh, and uh, ferrets do get a tumor called lymphoma of the spleen, but as far as actual incidence and other types of tumors and other species, we just really don't have a very clear picture uh, on those numbers yet. So if we turn a little bit to talk about some treatment-related concepts, probably the first one to get over is what is chemotherapy. Um, and chemotherapy is the use of drugs to treat patients with or who are at risk for systemic cancer. And you really should think about chemotherapy as being a total body treatment. Um, the strength of chemotherapy is that it's administered and it can be administered a lot of different ways. There's chemotherapy tablets and injections and, and things like that. Um, but that once administered, it's going to spread throughout the body. And if there's cancer cells hiding in any location, then theoretically, chemotherapy has a chance of dealing with those cancer cells. Uh, now we know that some parts of the body are harder to treat than others. Uh, but as a general rule, you should think about chemotherapy being a total body therapy. Uh, chemotherapy is the primary therapy for tumors that we know are systemic at the time of diagnosis. Uh, the classic example there would be a tumor called lymphoma, which is a lymphatic cancer. It is a very common tumor in both dogs and cats. Uh, and we think of when we, when we are initiating therapy in those patients, the first thing we're going to reach for is a chemotherapy protocol. Now, there are lots of different chemotherapy protocols that are specific for individual types of cancer. Uh, and for tumors such as lymphoma, there are multiple different protocols, even just for that particular tumor. Uh, so really, when you're choosing a protocol, that guidance needs to come uh, based on exactly what tumor type the patient has, uh, what, how much cancer does the patient have, and things like that. And those are probably questions best answered uh, in talking to an oncologist to help guide you along that pathway. Um, we also think about chemotherapy being an adjuvant therapy or, or a prophylactic therapy uh, in patients that are at risk for developing metastasis. Uh, and probably the classic example there is a tumor called osteosarcoma, which is a tumor of giant breed dogs, so Great Danes and Rottweilers and guys like that. Uh, and it's a tumor that usually affects one of the bones of the leg. And uh, that tumor, even with amputation, so we know we've gotten good control of the primary tumor, it's been removed from the body, still about 95% of those patients will go on and develop uh, tumor spread. 
um, primarily to the lungs. So in that setting, we would use chemotherapy as a way to try to prevent or delay the onset of those clinically detectable uh, metastases. Uh, we, if we're going to talk about chemotherapy, we do at least have to touch on toxicity. Uh, and again, we'll spend a whole talk just on veterinary uh, chemotherapy toxicity. But for this talk, let's just say that it's generally well tolerated in veterinary patients, although we do have to always consider toxicity when we're treating a patient with chemotherapy. Uh, the two body systems that we're most concerned about are the gastrointestinal tract and the bone marrow. Um, when we think about gastrointestinal toxicity, that would be things like nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Uh, absolutely does happen, but it's generally less severe than what we see in human cancer patients, and it tends to be much more manageable. Um, so yes, we do see those things, uh, but all in all, dogs and cats tend to tolerate uh, the gastrointestinal effects of chemo pretty well. Um, we also worry about the bone marrow and what's called hematologic toxicity. And what we mean by that is suppression of the normal cells that, that should be made in the bone marrow. So that can be white blood cells that make you more prone to infection. Uh, that could be platelets, which are a, a component of our clotting cascade. Uh, they help us, you know, help a blood clot form. So if you really suppress the platelets, you could have bleeding issues. And then with long-term chemotherapy administration, we can start to see anemia as well. Uh, most of the hemologic, hematologic side effects of chemotherapy can be dealt with pretty effectively, especially if you're quite diligent in your monitoring and are being sure that you don't have um, significant issues that need to be dealt with. And probably one final take-home point about chemotherapy is that Veterinary chemotherapy protocols really are designed to try to strike a balance between quality of life and treatment-related issues. Uh, so the goal is to find an effective treatment for the tumor that does not severely impact your patient's quality of life. And the reason we, we choose this route is that we know that veterinary cancer patients don't have a 20 or 25 year chance of survival uh, after they're treated with chemotherapy. So it doesn't make a lot of sense to most veterinary oncologists to look at a patient that may ha maybe has 12, 18 months survival and say, well, I'm going to make you really sick for nine months of that. So the goal of most veterinary chemotherapy protocols is to, again, treat the tumor, but at the same time try to preserve and maintain your patient's quality of life all the way through therapy uh, so that you're not really having to, to deal with those kind of really uh, aggressive side effects. Um, you know, it's always a risk to benefit analysis, and for each individual patient, there will be things they tolerate and things they don't. Uh, so that you absolutely will sometimes see a patient that just cannot tolerate the protocol that you wanted to use for a particular cancer, um, and you have to kind of constantly reassess the risks of treating that patient with the benefits of doing so. But usually we're able to strike a pretty good balance uh, between the, the risks and the benefits, and in most cases, see that the benefits of treating a cancer patient is going to far outweigh the risks. So then a, a completely different treatment modality for cancer is radiation therapy. Uh, and radiation therapy is the delivery of damaging, also called ionizing radiation, targeting a tumor while attempting to spare normal tissues. And really, that is... There have been huge technological advances in the treatment of, of patients, both human and veterinary, with radiation therapy. And most of those technological advances have been improvements in our ability to position a patient and to kind of lock them into place and make that positioning very reproducible, uh, but also to deliver the dose of radiation just to the tumor site while really sparing uh, the normal surrounding tissue. Uh, you should think of radiation therapy as primarily used to treat locally aggressive tumors. Um, so unlike chemotherapy, radiation therapy does not impact the whole body. It is only going to treat a tumor where it's aimed. Uh, so we use radiation to try to get a, a tumor under control uh, that is otherwise uh, behaving in an unfriendly manner uh, to its neighboring normal tissue. Um, we sometimes use radiation as adjuvant therapy in patients that uh, we know we need to gain local control of tumor, 
but then that tumor may also have uh, metastatic potential. And, and since radiation is not going to impact the whole body, we know we're going to have to get chemotherapy on board if we're really going to have a chance of getting that tumor long-term controlled. Uh, probably the best example there uh, right now is, is uh, canine oral melanoma. So melanoma is the most common tumor in the mouth of elderly dogs. Uh, and it, we've got a protocol where you use radiation to control the tumor within the mouth and then follow up with a vaccine. There's actually a melanoma vaccine that, that primes the body's immune system to, to fight off the, the spread of the disease. Uh, and that's actually been a fairly successful strategy. But neither one of those things by themselves would be controlling for an individual melanoma patient. You really have to do both of those things if you're trying to treat that patient with curative intent. Uh, really think about radiation and surgery as being two tools designed to accomplish the same goal, that of local tumor control. Um, surgery sometimes uh, wins uh, because I don't think there's really any better tumor uh, or any better treatment for a tumor than being able to remove the cancer from your patient, uh, but surgery is often limited by anatomical constraints. Um, you may need to do an amputation to get the tumor in a patient that can't really tolerate an amputation. He's got another bad leg or, or something along those lines. Um, the biggest downside to radiation therapy is that um, while it's not usually anatomically constrained, we can get places with radiation that we may not be able to get with a scalpel blade. It can fail if the tumor is inherently resistant to radiation. And that's true of any form of cancer treatment. Just because we decide to treat a tumor with some form of therapy, doesn't mean that the tumor will actually care. Uh, and so you will see patients that you do everything by the book, you follow the treatment recommendations exactly right, and the tumor sort of scoffs at your efforts and just continues to behave in an aggressive manner. Um, and that's really just the nature of the beast, the fact that, uh, that cancer doesn't always do what we want it to do. And then I guess uh, something that we'll talk about quite a bit in another, in another video is that the, the technical advances I had mentioned earlier, such as stereotactic radiation therapy and intensity modulated radiation therapy, have greatly improved our ability to treat cancer. So to put a really big dose of, of radiation into, a, into the, the cancer itself while sparing the normal healthy tissue around it. And that's a huge boon to our cancer patients. Uh, because we are getting a better controlling dose of radiation into the cancer uh, with much less toxicity to the patient than what we used to get with the more conventionally fractionated protocols. Uh, so pretty interesting stuff, and, and the technical advances in radiation therapy over the last five years or so have been really, really dramatic. Uh, another question we get is what is an oncologist and why am I here to see you? And so um, an oncologist or a veterinary oncologist is a doctor of veterinary medicine, so they've completed their veterinary program, uh, who has advanced training in the diagnosis, treatment, and care of veterinary cancer patients. Uh, in order to call yourself a specialist or to be uh, considered board certified, you have to go through a series of steps and you have to be board certified then by the appropriate veterinary college. For medical oncology, so medical oncologists primarily deal with patients needing chemotherapy, uh, that uh, certification body is the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine, a specialty of oncology. For radiation oncologists, so someone who primarily uh, deals with treating cancers with radiation, that board certification is performed through the American College of Veterinary Radiologists specialty of radiation oncology. And so then that kind of begs the question, what exactly does board certification entail? And it's a multi-step process. Um, the process of board certification in any specialty requires additional training after you've completed your veterinary degree. So you've gotten your DVM, your Doctor of Veterinary Medicine, and then you've decided that you want to go on and specialize in a certain branch of medicine, then there's a process that you have to follow uh, to go through that. 
So step one for most programs is to complete a one-year internship uh, that rotates through multiple specialties. So internal medicine, radiology, surgery, oncology, dermatology, you know, there's lots of different specialties. And most internships try to rotate you through as many as they can in a year. And the reason for that is they want to expose you to multiple different facets of specialty medicine, but also to give you a chance to be really sure that you're picking the specialty that, that you want uh, as you move forward. Um, because it can be, there's almost a, a, a bewildering array of specialists now uh, and subspecialists. And so you really want to try to be sure you're picking what you want before you get started down that pathway. Uh, once you've completed your internship and decided on the branch of medicine you want to specialize in, then you will enter a focused residency uh, training just in the specialty that's being pursued. Uh, most programs are a minimum of three years, although they may be longer, um, depending on the specialty itself, and then if you have any advanced degree aspirations to go along with that. So if, uh, if your veterinarian decided that he wanted to be board certified in oncology and also have a PhD, well, that's probably closer to a five or six year program rather than a three year program. Uh, there are also veterinarians who are board certified in multiple specialties, which typically means that they have to complete each part of that program separately to get certified in each of those specialties. Uh, most specialties have a research and publication requirement, meaning that you're mandated to perform original research in that field and then to publish that research in the appropriate peer-reviewed journal. And then the final step for any successful candidate to be board certified is to take and pass an examination that deals pretty much with all aspects of their chosen specialty. Uh, the nature of the exam will differ very much uh, between specialties. Um, a diagnostic radiologist is going to be expected to read CAT scans and ultrasounds and x-rays whereas a radiation oncologist is going to be expected to do uh, safety checks and calculations for radiation therapy and things along those lines. So each specialty has a, a core knowledge base that uh, the certifying body thinks is required for you to know in order to be board certified by them. And that's really what the exam uh, for each specialty tests. So if we look at what board certification entails, uh, it's a multi-step process that takes a little bit of planning, a little bit of time to complete. If we look at the entire process, it's an undergraduate education uh, to get into veterinary school. That usually will take you two to four years, uh, depending on the program. Then veterinary school uh, doctorate programs are all four years now. So you've got four years of veterinary school, then a one-year internship, and then a three-year residency. So all in all, it will take you 10 to 12 years to complete, and that's assuming that you do each step in immediate order, so that you graduated from veterinary school and immediately matched with an internship program, and then immediately went from your internship program into your residency. And then I guess the final question is, how do you find a veterinarian that's board certified? Um, if you know that that your dog has a heart problem and you want a cardiologist or it's got cancer and you want an oncologist, well, are there, there are resources out there to help you find a board certified veterinarian? Uh, and most specialties do maintain a database of board certified individuals. So if you've been board certified by a college, they will maintain a database uh, that's usually accessible to uh, the pet owning public. So for the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine, uh, so medical oncology, cardiology, neurology, lots of different specialties. Uh, they have a web address, acvim.org, and if you go there, there's actually a pet owner section and uh, find a specialist um, application that will let you enter your geographic data and it'll find the closest person to you. Uh, similarly, the American College of Veterinary Radiology uh, maintains a similar database. Uh, their address is acvr.org. And again, they also have a pet owner's uh, portion of that website. So thanks for watching. Um, like us if you like us. Uh, and if pass this video on, if you know someone who's maybe struggling with some of these issues uh, and needs a little guidance. Um, and please understand that it's not possible uh, for us to offer either diagnostic or therapeutic advice 
uh, based on a patient that we've never seen before. And we'll see you next time.